I will call to order the City Council Special Study Meeting for January 12, 2015. We have the roll call, Mr. Mayor Slater? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Campbell? Here. Councilmember Gottlieb? Here. Councilmember Henderson? Here. Councilmember Hoderick? Here. Councilmember Pennington? Councilmember Teets? We have a quorum. We will deal with absences at the regular council meeting. We have one discussion item this evening. C1 is the Big Beaver Move Across Troy Symposium findings. So I will turn the table over to City Manager Brian Kishnick. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, let's, let's qualify findings and report as it stands today. And I'm going to talk about the process a little bit. But let me back you up because we have the City Council here, but we also have mem many members of the DDA who, who came. Because this move across <coughs> Troy Big Beaver Road Pedestrian Symposium started when Chairman Alan Curlick caught me after a DDA meeting at about 6.30 in the morning and <laughs> said, you know, wouldn't it be really it neat, like it. it seemed like it, yeah, <laughs> wouldn't it be really neat if we got a lot of experts together and stakeholders together and, you know, David Hay from Cali Services and people together who could talk about um, Big Beaver and how to make it more pedestrian friendly. So from that became what staff has uh, termed move across Troy. And the process is such that we had the stakeholders in on day one and then in day two, uh, we had all the, uh, and you'll hear some of this in the presentation, we had it open to the community at the community center, it was very well attended, to get people's input on where they see the issues, where they see obstacles, where they see opportunities, where they see things working well, and then looking at uh, uh, funding levels um, on top of that. Um, as we move forward. So tonight what we're here to do is give a brief overview and a status of the project and some ideas as we know them today and our consultant Mark DeLaverne is also here to uh, participate in the presentation to show us where we are today and there's a lot of work left to be done but we have an hour so we wanted to keep it uh, to an overview of the move across Troy. So with that I want to invite Maggie Hughes who is the lead on this project uh, and has done a great job pulling people together and uh, putting this presentation together as well. So, Maggie. Right, well, thank you, Mayor and City Council and members of the DBA for coming today. Um, when we start looking at this project, and especially in Big Beaver Road, um, the numbers kind of tell the story to kick us off. So, we look at Big Beaver, and there are 1,600 businesses um, on or along within 300 feet of Big Beaver. So, with that, there are 50,000 vehicles that travel it each day, which means this is our most visible and most well-traveled road throughout Troy, easily. Um, so we know that people are driving up and down it and seeing it, but what, what does that mean for our pedestrians that are walking up and down it? Um, another thing that brought this to the forefront was we had um, our changing demographics demand. So what we mean by that is um, we have businesses that are coming into the community, especially um, over at Automation Alley, which are these high-tech companies, and they're attracting people um, that like a certain lifestyle, especially these um, young engineers and young tech people that um, are looking for a lifestyle where at work they can also enjoy themselves by you know, going out for lunch, walking down the street. Um, so we had Kristen Baird, who's the Executive um, Director of Programs and Relations at Altair, tell us that when they have clients um, come in to Altair, they have to send them to hotels outside of Troy because they don't have anywhere. If they come to Troy, even though there are a number of hotels even right along Big Beaver, um, they're staying over the weekend or overnight and there's nothing for them to do because they don't have cars, they've flown in and they've had to get picked up and drop off and then if they're in Troy, they're just stuck at their hotel. So they're able to send them to surrounding communities where they can walk around and go get dinner. Um, and this was just kind of a glaring problem that we saw, especially with the development that we're seeing along Big Beaver. The Big Beaver Form Bay Zoning District was established along a significant portion of Big Beaver Road. It's essentially a little bit past collision, a little bit past Rochester Road. It's a pretty big chunk of, of Big Beaver. <clears throat> One of the goals of the Big Beaver District is to implement the Big Beaver Corridor Study and create a world-class corridor along Big Beaver. The district includes a number of requirements that are put into place to ensure that new projects that are constructed along, constructed along Big Beaver have a strong relationship with the street. This, this slide shows a lot of the elements that are required. I'll, I'll use my pointer here. There's, a, there's a, uh, a front door entrance required on Big Beaver. We have transparency requirements, so you, you see a lot of glass. 
that engages the street by allowing you to see the activity in the building from the street. We've got lighter sidewalks. We've got benches, planter boxes, pedestrian scale lighting, public art, and it, the, the district allows mixed use, such as retail and restaurants. So we have a wide range of, of uses that are permitted. To truly become a world-class corridor, we need more residential, more pedestrian activity on the street. To get back to residential uh, development. This is an example. This is uh, Kilmer Place residential development. It's a 16-unit development. It's actually part of a, of a mixed-use development that's, that fronts on Big Beaver. <coughs> it's a, at the corner of Big Beaver and Kilmer, just to the east of, of us. Uh, a slide I don't have is of, of uh, Amber Apartments, which is a 46-unit apartment building located at the corner of Livernoy and Town Center Drive. It's about a quarter mile from Big Beaver, Big Beaver but it is walkable to Big Beaver. We're, we're going to see more residential development. This is important to, to have more pedestrian activity, to provide more housing opportunities. As we see more development, not only residential, but also commercial and uh, retail restaurant, we're gonna, it's going to generate more activity. And that only creates more of a need to get people safely and conveniently along Big Beaver and across Big Beaver. Another thing to kind of show where we were and how we got to where we are today is looking at the current state of our crosswalks. Um, so this is an east-west crosswalk that we have right now along Big Beaver um, that just displays some of the kind of current problems and obstacles that we're facing. Um, so one thing that we've noticed now is that um, we have to focus and worry about our maintenance and if we really expect people to walk, um, how are we going to handle some things like this? Um, and then another barrier, kind of where we were, was the I-75 underpass. So this is a huge feature along Big Beaver Road, um, but something like the fence and the kind of dimly lit area wasn't very welcoming. So our very first partnership was with MDOT, and we were able to um, fix and replace the fencing under I-75. And then this spring, we'll also be planting some trees. So that's kind of the first step from where we were, where it was a poor state, poor condition, recognizing the problem, to where we are now, which is we're trying to improve this and. Um, and make it better so that people are more encouraged just visually to walk along Big Beaver. And then RCOC will always be a partner um, whenever we're talking about the Big Beaver corridor because it is their road. Um, the next step of kind of where we are is that we hired a consultant, Mark Laverne from Sam Schwartz Engineering. He is the creator of the Chicago Pedestrian Plan. Um, we brought him in as our expert um, in this field because we felt that he could really help us transform the corridor. <coughs> We held two, as Brian talked about, two meetings, the first being the private working meeting, um, which was with community experts and stakeholders to really ask them what was their vision for Big Beaver Road. Um, we know what we'd like to see, but these are the people that live and work it every day. So we had everybody come in and we talked through some <coughs> ideas and techniques. We went on a walking tour to really see and experience what it feels like for a pedestrian every day. And we took that information into the second day, which was our um, public symposium held over at the community center over two times, once in the afternoon and um, once in the early evening. And we really wanted to see, again, so the first kind of, we, we talked to the business stakeholders and our experts, but now, again, what, what are the people saying? And this was attended by residents, this was by, attended by um, brokers and leasers and, and business owners. And we showed on this map on the right, you can see this is just one cross-section that we focused on. Um, so the stars represent where people go, where do you want to go, where are you trying to get, and then the green boxes where their suggestions and like what do they like, what don't they like. And we took all this information and um, gave it to um, Mark to the burn, and he came back to us with the plan. And you all have copies of the plan um, in front of you, so we're going to kind of summarize it a little bit in this presentation, highlight the important things, but um, please take home that plan and read it for you. Thanks, Maggie. Maggie gave me way too much credit. Uh, I, I, one of the things that's been really remarkable uh, working here, Troy, is you know, how talented the staff has been here, um, both from you know how much they have pushed us, but also you know a lot of the stuff that's in these plans was developed by staff, as well as through the the symposium was a really impressive effort. Uh, you know, you go to a lot of public meetings and you know the same twelve people show up and you don't really hear anything. Um, for both the, the amount of input, but also the creativity that went into that um, to be driven by a public sector is not something you typically see. And that's why they hire consultants to do these things. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed working here. You guys should uh, thank yourselves you know, for you know, how great the staff you have. Um, so, you know, Big Beaver is, to me, a, a really unique opportunity. Um, you know, if you look across the US, the Midwest, Michigan, 
you'll find a lot of corridors, you know, with, that can carry a lot of traffic, have a lot of businesses on them, um, but don't have the level of pedestrian infrastructure that's already out here. Um, most suburban municipalities, I'd say 95%, um, don't have this sidewalk network that you have. You know, they have it bits and pieces, but not to sort of a level that you guys have that you can walk from one side of the corridor to the other. They don't have intersections that have just simply walk signals to allow pedestrians to let them know. You know? So the, the corridor itself is much further along than probably a lot of the competition that you face. However, there's a lot more that we can do. And speaking to, to what Maggie was talking about, you know, we're evolving as a society when it comes to you know, what we desire out of transportation. And walking is a big part of that. Um, you know, the ability to simply you know, walk across the street to get a coffee, or if I'm staying at the Marriott, cross the street to go grab a drink as opposed to driving across the street. Um, and that's probably the, the biggest opportunity here, is, is to take all the great things in Big Beaver and continue to evolve um, so that the, the corridor can evolve to the future demands um, and allows you to remain competitive um, and to continue to, to prosper. So the plan that you have in front of you uh, is, you know, what will we come up with? And we started with a toolbox. Um, you know, this is a plan, it's not a full design. What we wanted to do was to begin to develop the initial toolbox of, of what should be used as part of the design processes that are going to come out of here. Um, there's a lot of different elements, um, and they're not all going to be used in every single location. Um, but it's, you know, to say this is what we can have, and then beginning to say why this should go and why this shouldn't go. Um, some of the stuff in the toolbox is already out there. You know, you see the, the crosswalks, the majority of the crosswalks along the corridor, what we call continental crossing, but it's like a big piano piece. Um, those have been shown to make drivers much more aware of pedestrians, and this is what, you know, when possible, you should be using all the time, you guys are already there. And then there's things that are, that, that are different, where you know, we talk about leading pedestrian intervals, which only happen in a few different cities in America, where pedestrians get to the street before the cars can go. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's new, uh, and it's something that's probably gonna have to be tried out and seen, seen what works best. But the idea was to, to build this toolbox and then say, you know, what do we wanna try here and what's gonna work best for Troy? And it'd be beautiful for them. So when looking at the corridor, there's three basic themes that need to be followed to begin design. One is continuity, um, and this is really important. You know, if we're asking people, you know, and always fit into the, the overall question, we're, we're asking people to make a choice to walk. We're not telling them they have to walk, but we're asking them to walk as opposed to driving to their destination. And to do that, we're going to have to compete with, you know, driving essentially. And one of it is making it as easy as possible. You know, if you're if you're in a building that's set back 600 feet from the sidewalk, you want to get just simply across the street from that building set back 600 feet, and then you got to walk a mile, a quarter mile one way, then a quarter mile back to the crossing. You're probably not going to walk. Um, so we need to make sure that this this corridor is continuous that we make it as easy as possible for, for pedestrians to get to their destinations. And that's across the street. The form based code obviously has a big impact of, of bringing those buildings closer, you know, so you don't have to walk through the parking lots, which there are some probably great parking lots to parking lot designers, but you know, walking through a parking lot is not a great experience. Um, so make, make sure continuity is, is a big part of this and overcoming barriers as well. But consistency is also a big part as well. You know, we both need to have pedestrians and drivers be really aware and, and have a real sense of reliability on the streets, you know, knowing where the crossings are as a driver, you know, not being surprised all of a sudden and not saying, well, I couldn't see that because it wasn't marked well. We want drivers to be aware, we want pedestrians to know where they're crossing now. You know, right now, if you cross Big Beaver, you're probably just crossing as quickly as you can because it's cold out and you don't want to be there. Um, but what we want to do is we want people to know where to cross. Um, and <clears throat> as we increase the pedestrian demand, we're going to have to, to do a decent amount of work to say this is really where we want you to cross and it's safe um, and it's a pleasurable experience and that fits in this one which is ease. It needs to be easy for people to, to, to cross and walk on the big beaver but it also has to be a little bit of fun as well. Um, you know the, the thing that we can't compete against with driving is sitting in your car is sitting in your car. You know you're not going to have artwork in, you know rotating in your car. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can do with the overall pedestrian, well, not yet, until Hollywood is coming. But the overall pedestrian experience is something that we can create that's unique, uh, and particularly unique to the Big Beaver corridor when you compare this to, to corridors in Southeast Michigan or across the Midwest, um, is creating something where, where people are like, you know, I, I want to walk. You know, I'm not walking because I have to, but because I'm making this choice and I want to walk. Um, and that, that's been built into the ideas as well. 
So obviously it's a very large portal, and you know tackling it all at once is probably something that's not feasible from either a cost standpoint, a time standpoint, or just a level of staffing standpoint. So what we wanted to do is, is identify some short-term notes in the first one to three years, uh, and then begin to look on a longer term. And we took this notable basis, and this is actually brought up by the mayor during the symposium, um, so that we could we could provide some focus, but also get an understanding of what works and, and try some things out. Um, in my opinion, one of the the flaws of the overall engineering world is we design and think that's that's it. We don't go back and look at the design six months later and say what can we tweak. Um, and when we're doing things, particularly something where we're, you know, we're trying to get behavior to be a little bit different uh, and, and people are going to be walking that aren't doing, there's probably going to be some things where we design and implement that need to be a little bit, whether it's signal timing, whether it's simply you know the, the shade of white that we're using for our problem. You know, there's a lot of different things that we're going to have to tweak a little bit. So we can't necessarily you know, we're not going to fail, but we can't be afraid to say, you know, we could have done that better and look back in six months. So when we, you know, we work on these first two or three nodes, and then we say, you know, this is, we feel very comfortable with these designs, and this is now what we can expand to the entire corridor. It's a much better use, in my opinion, of resources, um, as well as making sure that this is a success, and that's really what we want to do. We don't want to just do something to say we did it. So the first uh, zone we're calling the, the Automation Alley Smart Zone, um, and this is looking at the Altair Crossing. Uh, the, the thing that really struck me during the, the symposium, uh, I was talking to a broker, and the, the broker basically said, the, the thing that tenants ask him along the Beaver Corridor, it's like the second question, how do, my, how, do the, how do people walk across to get to the Starbucks? How do I walk to the Starbucks? Um, it's not a question brokers heard five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, you know, but you know, with a, a younger, you know, millennial just taking over the workforce, um, and this is what, you know, employees and, and young people are demanding, and you need to have an answer for that because you know a lot of places on Big Beaver. If you were from California, and you looked in the aerial, you wouldn't necessarily know how you get from here to Starbucks. Um, and Altair is a good example. You can sit outside the the front door of, Star of Altair. You can look across the street, and you can see that there's a Starbucks over there, but it's not necessarily you, you know, something you would walk to because it's it's you have to walk two parking lots and walk about almost a half mile to get there. Um, so looking at a new crossing, um, the direct crossing from Altair to the north, um, you can see here is a potential design. You know, these are just conceptual designs. You know, once we get into to engineering, we'll get into the nitty gritty of, of exactly where, where things will go and turn radiuses and all that. But you know, beginning to lay the concept out here. It's also important though that the protection goes through the parking lot as well. Um, because just dropping them off on the sidewalk and then having people meander through a parking lot not knowing where they're going. Um, and not having a, a safe connection through the parking lot is, is not, you know, we're not fully completing the task. Um, so making sure this is going from destination to destination with the crossing is going to be very important. And we're designing, obviously, you know, we, we want to do things that um, when we talk about the, the consistency and as well as the ease and the overall aesthetic, um, you know, this is an example of, of taking a crosswalk and adding a little bit more fun to it with some steps. You know, whether we, we showed some examples during the symposium of color, um, other things you can do to, to make people stand out, but also grab people's attention. Um, you know, there are people out there walking in the corridor, and it was, that was one of the things that surprised me how many people were walking on the corridor, because, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting them, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, when we get, when we're trying to ask people to, to walk and they've never walked before, we want them to make it very easy for them to know where they're supposed to walk. Um, whether it's the crosswalk or whether it's some sort of signage, to really grab people's attention and say, oh, I get it, this is where I'm supposed to walk. And then looking at this, what I call the space in the middle, you know, the, the landscape median uh, that we have. You know, it, it's, it's enough room, obviously, for pedestrians to, to have refuge and wait so that they don't have to cross all the lanes of traffic as well. But looking at ways of, of how we can even make that space a little bit better. Um, this sort of shows an example of, of some, uh, basically a shelter. Uh, we'll have some more renderings, you know, whether it's just something that's just, you know, protects you from the weather, whether it's rain or snow, or something that's interactive. Um, you know, it's, it's a space that can be imagined. Uh, it's a small space. It's not a space where you say, I want to go to the medium. But if we're having people walk, you know, why not take advantage of that space and add to the overall pedestrian experience? The next one is looking at uh, the area around Civic Center Drive. Um, and this is where, you know, when I, the first time I was here, I, I stayed at the Marriott, and, you know, I, I saw two things that jumped out of me. One was, um, you know, people asking the concierge where they could go for a run. And then the second was seeing people actually running on Big Beaver. Um, 
and this is where you're driving, you know, you're drawing a market of people, you know, that aren't from the area, um, and that may have an expectation that they can stay in a hotel, and you know, they get a car from the airport, or like me, they take the train in now, which was a wonderful train ride, by the way, on time, too. Um, but you know, and don't want to drive, want to have the expectation that you know they have options around them. And part of that option is going to be crossing the street, you know, to get to a future restaurant um, or a bar or, or whatever to, to go to when they're outside and not just be essentially trapped inside the Marriott. Um, but, you know, right now crossing, crossing here is, is a challenge because you don't have that option. And, if, you know, when I stayed at the Marriott, I just stayed in Marriott and grabbed a drink at dinner there because I didn't have a car. So looking at a new crossing at Spencer Street, which obviously is directly across from the Marriott, but then also looking at a crossing Part of the building we're at now um, to really improve that north-south connectivity um, between the, <coughs> the city center of the Marriott and the, the developments on the south side of the street. I think there's just some some renderings that um, Dick and Ben and his team were able to work up to just begin to think. And the thing that really stands out here to me is, is just looking at you know what that refuge island is. That's the biggest difference when you look at something right now. I mean, other than it's a completely new intersection, is, uh, you know, when you cross the street, you don't really have that that experience right now. And there's a lot of things that we can do, I think, to, to make it seem like, and it also makes it seem like a much shorter walk as well. You know, if you're only crossing 36 feet of traffic, and then you stop, and then you know there's something at least to see at 36. It, it, you know, it's not something necessarily that's going to make you want to cross the street, but it'll, you know, go into your sub subconscious to make the experience feel like it was, a, it was much different than necessarily crossing you know, 100, 120 feet of, of pavement. Just another, another example of the random, very nice enough. And then we get to the, what essentially is the largest barrier um, along the corridor being I-75. I-75 obviously has helped support a lot of the growth. Um, along the corridor, having the, the access, providing the regional access. Um, but it also, as a pedestrian, basically separates the corridor into the east side and west side. Um, and there are two reasons for this. One is the ramps essentially were designed to get cars in and out as quickly as possible. You know, they're standard suburban you know, uh, <clears throat> clover leaves. And, you know, drivers, you know, whether they're coming, either coming off the highway, they haven't seen a pedestrian in 20 minutes to two hours. They're not necessarily thinking the first thing they're going to interact is a pedestrian coming off. And similarly, you know, when you're turning onto the expressway, you know, your mind's flipped over to, I got to start dealing with trucks and, you know, I'm not even, you know, considering pedestrians. So, those are challenges right now to cross. Maggie showed the picture, but just from a speed standpoint, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, and to to develop this full full corridor, you know, we need to make sure that connectivity works and it's a safe crossing. Um, but then, in addition to the ramps themselves, <coughs> the structure is a challenge. Uh, you know, these weren't designed, particularly underneath, to say how are people are going to pleasantly walk across, you know, through the corridor. Fortunately, there's there's a lot of things that we can do. You know, there's infrastructure there. You know, we just need to basically use that as our canvas and figure out what can we do to make it a better experience. Um, and there's a lot of different things that people have done. We've got some pictures from the plan here. Whether it's like creative lighting um, or some sort of artwork, it obviously brightens it up from, and it sort of takes that giraffe place and creates a, a place that at least is somewhat welcoming. But it also helps in this overall branding. You know, as a driver, you're gonna see this. And you're the driver, you're gonna notice this. And you know, if you're living in uh, another community, I won't say anyone, but if you live in another community and you, know, you work in the Big Beaver Corridor, you know, you're going to mention this to your wife or to your friends. Like, have you seen what the cool thing they're doing there? And you know, they might never see it, but you know, again, it's, 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 it's creating this whole atmosphere um, along the Big Beaver Corridor that both people are experiencing every day, but then people are knowing about as well and branding it as a, as a different place. So, hand it off to Mark. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have two slides. So, after Mark and his team at um, Sam Schwartz Engineering completed this, we wanted to take the the uh, priorities and cost them out and try to identify some funding sources. So, city staff worked with Carolina Wardman to do that. And as you can see, the Automation Alley Smart Zone Mid Block Crossing, we estimated about three hundred sixty thousand dollars. The, the Civic Center includes two crossings. One being the Civic Center Drive at $480,000, Spencer Street $420,000, and then the I-75 includes two things, interchange reconfiguration $300,000, and the underpass improvements at $240,000. So then, um, Carolina Wardman took an exhaustive effort to find uh, funding opportunities for these projects. 
and we found the primary sources to be MDOT, Michigan Department of Transportation, and SEMCAI. So we met with both of them together. But first I'm going to talk about the top bullet point, because the Automation Alley Smart Zone Mid-Block mid -block Crossing has the LDFA as a potential funding source as part of the Automation Alley Smart Zone. But then when we start talking about the Civic Center Crossing, it's eligible for the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is commonly known as the TAP program, because it links to the city's proposed trail and pathways plan, which will eventually then connect to the Clinton River Trail, which then connects to the whole region and state from a, from a um, transportation standpoint. The, that then allows it to score much higher. The uh, TAP applications are due April in April of 2015 and every year in April. I-75 improvements and funding are contingent on MDOT and we need to get together with them and talk about what we can do and where that funding can come from. All projects will require a city contribution. And then there's another issue which we talked a lot about internally and we talked about maybe sponsor contributions but we thought if that was to occur we have to get all of the business communities together, business community together, property owners and have them come together and decide what would be the best way to help invest in these types of projects. So that's something that we're going to have to investigate a lot more and look at in the future. So we also did want to stop at those two notes. We wanted to begin to look at a longer term view as well. Uh, you know, much, much longer in the future, we want to obviously have some successes and get the ground. But developing this notable approach and, and expanding into the entire corridor, you know, so we developed a note around the Coach Highway and the, the Somerset Collection, um, also around Crooks Road, and then the Rochester Road as well. And as we move black crossings, because around the area of Rochester Road, it's like a mile and a half or so between crossings, which is just unacceptable. You know, it's, you're just never going to get anyone across the street other than right in the intersection. So uh, today, Brian posed the question to me, you know, if we build all this, are people actually going to come? And uh, I think it's a firm maybe with just building it. You know, we build it particularly, you know, around places where that we think there will be successes, you know, Altair and the Marriott where we've got these audiences. There are people out there that are, that are going to walk and you have that crossing, it's going to work. But there's going to be a segment of the population where we're going to have to give a nudge to, you know, that, you know, see it but or you know heard you know about their friend walking to Starbucks but they're not sure just gonna keep driving. You know, we're gonna have to do a little bit of pushing as well. Um, so there's a, there's an initial section in here about some encouragement program encouragement programs and just overall programming to say how do we begin to brand this as a, as a place to walk and how do we begin to reach out to employers to say you guys should give a little nudge to your, your employees to do some walking. Um, there's some samples here and, and some of it's just taking Unused parking space and, and creating some different things, you know, whether it's large scale games to just simply what's called parking day, which is one day a year where people just take over parking spaces and, you know, set up their office with a little green, you know, lawn chair and everything and some Wi Fi. Um, <coughs> allowing artists to, to do some stuff with the sidewalk as well, um, particularly when we begin to talk about directing people to crossings. I think this could be a, a, a pretty cool thing. Um, but also allow people to do some exploring and some, you know, Pioneering almost, you know, to, to begin to, to see things that are going on. Looking at outdoor events, you know, and whether it's um, what we call in the plan cycle is where you know corridors get you know shut down for a Sunday between seven o'clock and nine o'clock in the morning for, for pets and bikes and to programming. So other things where we can do particularly with the health community to partner with. You know, there's the thing about this is there's so many opportunities for partners, and whether it's partners along the business corridor, whether it's institutions in the region. Um, that can come and, and, and help create the atmosphere that we want to, to make it happen. Um, but, but it's going to take a combination of this, you know, and it's going to take some work, and it's not just the engineering department. That's why, um, you know, a lot of things we talked about was how do we actually make this happen? And one of the things we talked about is you know, having that point person for this effort, not just for the, the planning effort itself, but the implementation. Because it's obviously designed, and there's tons of stuff to talk with MDOT and Road Commission about. There's lots of outreach to the employers, and there's got to be somebody that's sh shepherding that, that whole that whole effort, and that's uh, why Maggie is uh, so valuable to this effort both for the planning and the implementation as well. So the Drew, we always try to end our study session before the questions with what would the directors be, where are we in, in this uh, whole thing? And you heard Mark kind of mention, and maybe it was mentioned early on, that the connection to the trails and pathways that Kurt's uh, spearheading, I know Kurt's back here, uh, it's so key to that Civic Center Big Beaver intersection that it connects that and the Clinton River Trail. So 
that they, they come kind of concurrently together. So we haven't prioritized these. We, you know, Ben is fond of saying, you know, you put these together sort of as bullet points, the short terms, but which could be funded first, right? So the LDFA money is, is down by Altair. That's, that's probably easiest. And then the, um, and then the Big Beaver Civic Center crossing because of the TAP funding where applications aren't due till April, but then you have to go through the process. So that was the second bullet point. So I'm just trying to give you some context of how it was put together without exactly prioritizing which one's most important because we don't have time today to drill down into every intersection, every every uh, drawing, and every every detail. But we thought, uh, as a as a starting point, what we should do is we definitely need to meet and review uh, the plan with MDOT and RCOC. And RCOC has given us their comments as late as Friday afternoon, so we didn't incorporate those in because it was kind of late. Uh, but MDOT certainly because of I-75 on and off ramps. Um, and Phil Hootery and Steve are both here who, you know, they maybe didn't say anything in this presentation, but in the internal several meetings that we have, they're very instrumental in telling us what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what seems like a, would pass the warrants and what wouldn't, and kind of what, what everybody's thinking. So that's a, that's a big help. Then I thought we should uh, meet with the original working meeting symposium group to discuss the options. That was the day one. Uh, Alan Kerlick and, uh, you know, most people here were there. And, MDOT, RCOC, Altair, a lot of people, most of council I think was, was at that meeting. After we meet with RCOC and MDOT, sort of bring the plan back <coughs> as it stands and, and discuss it uh, at that level. Um, you know, we didn't talk a lot about this, but in previous meetings we have talked about the maintenance of the corridor. So I have it on there and it may seem like kind of an outlier, but Maggie did show the, uh, the sidewalk. and. Day one, you know, everyone who took the tour saw the, the one and a half shoes on the sidewalk uh, along with the gravel. So there's a maintenance issue, as the mayor likes to say, we, we, we've become focused on the middle, the median uh, of the big beaver corridor, which is a good thing, but we need to focus on the outside as well because of the, uh, the, the pictures that you did see. So we need to discuss that protocol and funding, and that's Kurtz put those numbers together and we presented them. But we, what we said was we would talk about that during the budget process. Um, and then we would establish recommendations after all that dialogue, uh, Mayor. So that's our presentation. There's a lot of people here who uh, have participated in this and can answer any questions. Thank you. Um, before I ask uh, Council of the I just want to say thanks to the uh, EDA members that did show up this evening to I know this quarter is of a, a, a big interest to you, and so I will open it up to you first. If you have any questions or if you want to ask something or say something. Um, no, Mr. Keith. Historical comment from the old guy here. <laughs> uh, as the city was developing, as folks were developing the, the road system within Big Beaver and adjacent to it, Years ago, the primary emphasis was maintaining the flow on Big Beaver Road. The result of that was, off, was, was actually some negative impact, offsetting Troy Center Drive, for example, so it didn't cross directly, things like that. Road Commission always has concern about maintaining flow, and I suspect they still do. When you start adding intersections, intersections in the form of pedestrian crossings, has it been, I know you're talking about, you'll have to have these discussions, has there been any comment with them, a discussion with them about the effect of putting more crossings in there and stopping traffic more often than, than every mile. Yeah, I, um, I brought up the exact same points uh, somebody asked me. Uh, specifically, we're talking about the uh, Civic Center here and, you know, why, why did we only put an emergency ramp there and didn't allow left turns and I did talk to MDOT people originally, and they said, well, you know, that was really the city's decision to, to do that because we were interested in basically moving traffic. And um, that was then, and here we are now, where we don't want to do that anymore. So, quite as efficiently. Yeah, quite as efficiently. And we still want to move, but, um, you know, here we are trapped. We trapped ourselves to some degree. So that's what I... 
I talked to them about this corner out here. You're going to put the hospital, you know, the children's hospital is going to go on this corner, Amber Apartments. This, this corner is going to get very congested within a year. Okay, so, you know, it's, it is an important node to us, I think, uh, and not, not three years from now, probably a year from now. So what kind of money do you want to spend? Do you want to spend it? fixing putting a band-aid on something where you might have to spend a lot of money and when I've talked to, to the Road Commission and, and that they seem very receptive to our ideas I don't want to speak for the latest correspondence that, that came but um, they still have concerns you know about light timing and things, things like that but I, I got the impression from them that they they were receptive to our ideas uh, Brian, I don't know if you you sense anything. No, no, I had the same meeting, and Bill can speak to the board. But I think it'd be premature to talk about their comments. There were there, there weren't a lot of comments. Put it that let's let's be honest about that. Now, Civic Center and at I seventy five is probably the most common and on right, Bill, and yeah. meeting wards. So. Right, and signals, signals in general. Signals in general, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know that would be the next step uh, there to, to have those discussions. I wouldn't want to represent them now before they have. No, I, my, I, my impression is that they aren't anti doing things. So I think that's a good thing. Um, and I, and I, I guess following up on that, not at all. I mean, a big part of what we're doing with road projects now, we have to look at the feds are requiring that we look at all modes of transportation. I mean, it, it's mandatory. I mean, it's not something you have to do it now. So they're much more in tune with it. David Evanco, who was at the initial meeting, sat on the state committee that, that formed the Complete Streets Policy. So they're very much in tune with that. So and that was, he was one of the gentlemen at the meeting as well as the managing director and um, deputy. So they provided their highest level people at the first meeting. So they're, they're very, very much aware of what we want to do and they're very supportive of what we want to do, especially after the road project we did last year. So they would, uh, they would like the opportunity to work more with us. Yeah, that's the sense I, I guess. Mr. Curl. Uh, overall, I mean, I, I'm real excited to see some of the ideas and, and the focus, especially in, in change. Uh, a couple things struck me. Number one, I thought the canopy in the island was a nice idea. You, I, did I see? I thought I saw a canopy shelter. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very cool and something that I consider more places than one. Because I think it's psychological if you've bad weather in Michigan here. You know, you don't aren't you aren't as anxious to take a chance in the traffic. You know, you might be a little more patient because it's not raining on you or something, right? Uh, the other thing is is trying to uh, is trying to can we work with lighting? I don't know how the feds feel and the county feels nowadays, but if we take these crossings and add lighting to it, you know, I mean, I mean, color, you know, not just white light, some something that gives that's sensory identifiable. It's a, it's more experiential for the past the pedestrian. Uh, I think that would be kind of fun to do, and I'm really concerned about how the bridge is dealt with. You know, really concerned about that. The other thing is when I saw the picture of the walkways, it, you know. There, you kind of lose sight of the extent of the walkways that we have, the width, and so on. And um, you know, we haven't done anything to put any type of infrastructure in for a pet, for like for running, jogging, walking. You know what I mean? Whether it's a marker in the sidewalk, so you know how far you've gone, or stop and rest, stop and stretch. You know, we haven't done anything like that to encourage people to uh, to utilize it for health and wellness. And the other thought is is that I think, you know, in terms of your symposium and or getting people together on the financing, as you get further along, you know, you might take what are called the stakeholders in a, in a neighborhood where you have a certain crossing and bring some of the stakeholders in and, and make a presentation, you know, and show how you work and what kind of source of money and what kind of money you still think you need and see if you can't get people to contribute whether it's a restaurant or a Columbia Center or the, or the hotels or, you know what I mean? See if we can't find some, a few dollars there. 
So, uh, you know, I, I'd encourage you to be very aggressive. I think it's a very good program. Very exciting to start. Yeah, I, um, that's why we asked the DDA members to be here today because there are, I don't want to speak for Mr. Bostic that's here today, but, you know, we're talking about focusing on all tar as the first node, and I know Mr. Bostic well enough to know that he would love to get yeah. those people on the south side of Big right. River over into the uh, right. Starbucks parking lot uh, and, right. yeah. and, and all of those restaurants. Yeah. I know he would be more than willing to work uh, right. with the city to make a pathway from across the street to... Right. So, yeah, I think that's a yeah. point. point yeah. We would be willing to contribute financially. I mean, it's going to be for our benefit. Sure. It's a win-win. I think it's right. those, those are win-wins. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the other thing. <laughs> is that I thought that the walkway in the island was a good feature it, because what it does is it allows some flexibility to identify ideal crossings because crossing on the north eastbound lanes may not be the same circumstance for crossing on the westbound lanes. Right. And so, you know, I, you know, I know it takes down trees or whatever, but I think that's a very good way to kind of calm the process. I like that. I think it's a great start, personally, um, with a lot of really good ideas. Uh, one of the most exciting things that I heard was that we, you know, we brought from somebody in from Chicago that told us that we have a treasure here. That he's, I don't want to. No, you do. I, I mean, want to speak. I don't want to speak. Because you do. I mean, you have infrastructure that you know whether you know. Even if it was, you know, about making cars, you know, you have the hard stuff that's gonna, like, you don't have to widen the street to put sidewalks in. You don't have to take parking lots. You've got that stuff in, and now you can really focus on what can, you know, you see sidewalks across America that just aren't used because nobody's figured out, you know, they're not disconnected, you can't cross the street. You guys have all that stuff, the hard stuff. Now you can focus on the stuff that's really gonna make them utilize. And you've been in, Around the country, you've done. I travel too much, correct? Travel, <laughs> you travel too much, and you you you've never seen anything like this. Not not in you know a, a roadway that carries fifty to sixty thousand cars, um, you know, and with a lot of land uses that are transforming. But you know, a lot of typical suburban, you know, where you have you know set back that far from the, the street, uh, you, know, you still see that. For, like, particularly for the length of the corridor you have, you, you might see it for a quarter mile. Like, you know, you travel around, you see these types of things that you just don't, you don't see it that like much here. And that's why, you know, you look at it and you see how much potential there is, adding in, you know, what's been done with the form-based code um, on how this can work pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's intriguing to hear um, the introduction of bicycles also um, in the club in that connection with the trail system. Um, it'll, be, it'll be good over time to learn more about how and when that could happen because um, I, I've used this West Side Highway before as a pedestrian and it's really cool. And you've got a ton of cars and you've got people walking and rollerblading and bicycles and it's all year round. People are out doing things. And um, so bringing, injecting that bicycle into it in a safe manner because I think there are a lot of places where you have bicycles separated from pedestrians. So you, you want to think in advance if we are going to allow rollerblading and bicycling and walking, we want to have it done in a way that's designed to accommodate all of those. But that's a great, that's something new that I hadn't heard of before. Any other comments? Uh, from don't, don't forget about future shuttle. Stop off at the same <laughs> no, point. Yeah, I think when you get to the council table, you'll probably hear from some council members that. You know, they have some visions that, that um, you know, don't include walking and they don't, it doesn't include uh, bicycles, other modes of transportation to move across the corridor, um, but we're talking money. So we have to start out with baby steps, see, see if a node will work here, if it'll work there, maybe we can use it somewhere else too. So, thank you for coming tonight, appreciate your input too. Anyone from council? Councilwoman Holder. Um, ditto on the shuttle. Um, it, it, I guess um, 
if you're looking for conceptual comments, it is understanding that ultimate vision of moving people, bicycling, walking. And, and I know we're talking about encouraging walking. When you're out there in the summer, they're walking and they're crossing the highway like Frogger. I, I, I really worry about the safety of the pedestrians in our community. Um, I think there's a misnomer that people aren't walking already. They are. That hotel gets finished up. We're going to have more. So the, we have an opportunity to seize on by taking these various dots that are there and connecting them smartly and with this vision. I don't pretend to think that that shuttle's happening next summer. I know it's more long range, but know that that's there because that should be part of the look and feel, I think. Um, the, the idea of private-public partnerships, you know, we're, we're looking at the, you know, MDOT, RCOC, the Road Commission and whatnot, but even within our community, it's great to hear our business leaders say, hey, you know, we're interested in helping do this. What kind of a financial infrastructure can we set up that allows for us to continue to develop? I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think that's something council from a policy-making body and, and city staff, maybe working with the Troy Chamber, what could we be looking at that helps enable the dreaming and scheming that we're looking at? Um, the trails and pathways, the Clinton River Trail, we, I hear from people all the time that they're glad to hear us talking about it. And helping our public, the stakeholders here, our taxpayers understand that this is all connected and it's about economic development for the entire city, both for our personal property values, the businesses, that needs to be part of our conversation constantly so that people help enable this to happen and see the vision. Um, it's part of the connecting. I think we have to do as leaders here um, to the best of our ability uh, going forward. So, Mayor Pro Tem Campbell. Uh, Brian, do you know, uh, you know I-75 obviously is going to be reworked at Big Beaver as well. Do we I know there's sketches of what that's going to look like. Is that going to change the on and off ramps where we can have an opportunity to get with those guys and work and develop something for crossing it? Because that's right now, that's probably the most dangerous place in the world. Yeah, so it's a Bill Hootery can answer the question because he's been working with them. Yeah, that, that section there is pretty much the last section that will be done. Because they're going to start to the north in 16 and they go to the south. The I 75 project is even years, I 94 is odd years. So Big Beaver is roughly. 2030, that's actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then all the you've got to turn left. Because we cross it by now. Yeah. <laughs> it's based on how MDOT has funds now, because they don't have the federal dollars in place, so they're using their own funds to fund these projects. Um, there is a whole design guideline that we spent over the past year, Troy, Madison Heights, all the bordering communities going through. Um, there's been some communication sent before you on that. Um, there's a draft document out right now. Um, the look and feel of I-75 in Oakland County is going to be dramatically different. Um, that's what that whole document is for, um, including the Big Beaver. Some of the things they were looking at on Big Beaver is where the side slopes come down, opening those areas up, adding some uh, art-type work underneath, lighting, all that stuff that we're talking about now is coming down the road. But it's quite a ways off. All the crossings would all be redone with um, colored pavement. Um, so a lot of the things that we're looking at with this plan are part of the future because MDOT's got the same uh, responsibility for, from the Fed as well to look at how they move people. Um, so a lot of those things will be coming, but not necessarily in the time frame that we would like to see them. I think if we're looking at a solution to get from the east side to the west side and back and forth, it's going to have to be something other than waiting for MDOT. Mm -hmm. Councilman Henderson. Uh, the day that we had that symposium, I think it was uh, you that mentioned our entrance and exit ramps are designed to throttle up as you get to them. And you had made a mention of uh, other communities, uh, no, uh, Consultant. Yeah, consultant. Uh, as you come into those, as you come into those situations, having a hard right turn, uh, is that kind of in our plan? Yeah, it's something. Again, this is conceptual. You know, I mean, I think that when we get to design, you know, there will have to be some give and take. Um, but if anything, we can do to to soften those curves up and then tighten them up, essentially, you know, so you have, so 
drivers have to slow down more aware of pedestrians is going to help out a lot. Because right now, you know, you know you're going, you just put your foot on the gas and you're turning over the brake is not what you're supposed to do. You know, you're getting ready to go on the highway. Um, and it's just a different change, you know, and it's, you know, designing interchange ramps for pedestrians is nothing anyone thought of up until five, ten years ago, really. You know, we just designed it to get the cars in and off as as quickly as possible. So, uh, but that's going to be an important thing is, is you know, making drivers aware, but then also figuring out ways to get drivers to stay out. So, again, the question being is, in a cost estimate, is that built and baked into those numbers or not at all? Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah, we could. Yeah, I mean, I 75, what we're looking at there is more of a kind of a pedestrian level lighting, possibly raised crosswalks. And then you start getting into reconfiguring ramps, and then you start getting into grades and that kind of stuff. So uh, you can run into big dollars real quick, and then again, when you do I 75, they can take a lot of that stuff out. So it's a balancing act of what can we do to make it more attractive, to make it easier for people to cross the ramps, but not to spend too much money that we're just going to secretly get thrown out. At one time, there were some more things on this plan sheet that um, we asked. Uh, yeah, but you can see, moved. you can see you, the, the two that are dramatic. This one, this one, you can really see through the gray. Those, those two have been tightened up. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's going to come down to both. You know, what, how much is something going to cost to get done to, to relocate her? Because it isn't just simply. <coughs> But that's not in any of your numbers, is that correct, or is it? Uh, there's a, I think there's a portion there, in We gave a much larger much, number for the original. We had a much larger number, and based on some discussions with some realities, we brought that number down to 300,000, and that's really just for the lighting, maintenance, um, some of the um, underpass I-75 stuff, so not, not some of the hard infrastructure associated with the ramp. Any other comments from Council? Councilman Gottlieb. Just a comment, maybe to echo uh, Councilwoman Florek's perceptions of it's going to boil down to who pays, who's going to write the check. And the opportunity to have business step up and say public and private funds working together to provide a perhaps even beta test for this to see if it works. I think you know, you're looking at the results of the planning doing a great job, but they only went part way. And our consultant comes in from Chicago, where I've lived, and they utilize this. They live with this. You look at Lakeshore Drive, and, and it's just packed with people. And they've integrated some of the things that we're talking about into their transportation. So. You know, we've, we've gone the step of making the change, bringing the buildings forward, doing all the things right, but we stopped short. <laughs> you know, if, so if we can get public and private teamwork working towards testing this, I think the opportunities there, we ought to try it as soon as possible. I agree. I uh, have said a while ago, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. We force the buildings to come up close. We force the buildings, the businesses to do all these things to make it pedestrian friendly for all the all the people, and then we make it so they can't walk. So you know, it seems like maybe we did this backwards, but uh, it is what it is. And I think um, I think there's a directive from council, at least from what I'm hearing, is to keep moving forward, uh, meet and review, uh, meet with the original. Symposium and funding for maintenance is, is something that I'd like to see um, see discussed quickly. Because when you look at those pictures and you look at the interchanges for I-75, it's um, I don't think it's anything that any of us want uh, as an appearance for Troy. Yeah, Kurt's already resubmitted the cost to me, and it'll be in in the budget that staff submits. Consideration. So the next point is to establish recommendations after <laughs> after some of the other stuff. <coughs> after a little bit of process goes on. Thanks. Thanks for all your hard work and thanks for coming this evening.
Um, I don't see that anyone is here to speak on public comment, so we are adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.